Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today we are jumping into Gen X. Exciting stuff. I am excited because I am a Gen Xer and we're talking about the Gen X gut check. Yep. So I'm excited to talk about this today and I want to start talking about Gen X. Let's go. So Gen X is really a, a people that were born between 1965 and 1980. It was like a long ways, but it's just 15 years. But that that was the generation that I am from and you're from. Yes. And we have found that a lot of people that follow us are from there. Or if they're not from that generation, they identify as a Gen Xer. Yeah. Right? I hate the word identify now. but Otherwise known as the best generation ever. I tell you what, we were tough. We were the ones that were left home alone with our, we had left home alone. We were, uh, we were not uh, micromanaged by our parents. We were, we were tough. We were tough. You know, we're the ones that we got, we got hurt. Parents said, ah, you're, you're fine. fine. Yeah. Drink out of the water hose. Stay outside. Mom, my tibia is sticking out of my leg. <laughs> ah, you're fine. Put some water on it. Yeah. They, it was, they were, we were a lot tougher back then. We were not coddled. That's for sure. Yeah. Not everybody got a trophy. <laughs> no. Yeah. There was truly. Yeah. First place, second yeah, place, third Gen place. X was the, yeah. Gen <laughs> X. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Gen X was really the generation that said, hey, listen, in life, there are people that win, people that lose. Not everybody comes out ahead yeah. on this. So you, you, and they started after that saying, everyone gets a trophy. No, that's not how life goes. Yeah, you our know? third grader came home with like an eighth place ribbon the other day. I and know. I was like, what is this? I said, who the <laughs> hell gives out an eighth, eighth? Do we have to say publicly our son had an eighth place ribbon? Because <laughs> that's not something I was really proud of. Eighth place ribbon. So anyway, yeah, not what we have. Hey, but not everybody's good at everything. I was thinking about Gen X. And how a lot of folks that that follow us are Gen Xers. Yeah. And um, I was thinking about things that we had when we were kids that were so different. No cell phones. No. Like growing up with no cell phone. Now I can't even, my kids, our kids can't even imagine. Not even no cell phones, but not even cordless phones at home. I mean, we used rotary phones that were still attached to the wall. I remember very well in our house in <laughs> upstate New York that I had a cord that wasn't very long. It was a big deal when I finally bought a cord. My mom didn't think I could do that, but I finally bought a cord someplace online. Online, There was no online back then. What am I saying? <laughs> I finally bought a cord at a store. At and Kmart. Kmart. Yes, Kmart. Yeah. That was, or yeah. Radio Shack. Yes. Boy, there's a blast <laughs> in the past. Yeah, I, I had forgot about those. And so I remember get, getting a long enough cord so I could sit on the basement steps and close the door and have a little bit of privacy with my phone calls with my girlfriends back then. <laughs> That's where I had my, not that I had girlfriends, honey. That's not what of I'm trying to say. Not. So. But I, that's where I had my conversation. You mean the nuns there. you were talking to? Yes, yeah. exactly. So, I can remember we, my, we can, my parents converted our garage that so was kind of a bigger living room. And my mom would sit in the chair that was closest to the phone on the wall. And we would be laying on the floor watching TV. And if the phone would ring, she would make us get up and go hand her the phone. <laughs> <laughs> how, about, how about watching, you mentioned TV. How about watching TV not on demand? Oh, yeah. You had to catch the show. Kids these days have no idea. Oh, no. The struggle was real. Yeah. If, you, if you got up, you, Saturday morning was cartoons. Yes. Saturday morning was cartoons. I Tom and Jerry. Bugs. If I got up early enough, I catch Johnny Quest. Do you remember Johnny Quest? I don't remember Johnny oh, Quest. Oh, I don't remember Johnny Quest. I was more like Flintstones and Felix the Cat and Pink Panther. Oh, and Johnny. I hope some of you listeners. Jetsons. I hope some of you listeners comment about Johnny Quest because he rocked. Oh, that was an amazing. I don't remember Johnny Quest. Oh, it was the oh, coolest. Oh, remember the show about the dinosaurs, the land before time or yes, something like that? With the, the sea squatch, the sea, the. the Sasquatch. No, oh, uh, the green characters there. Oh, I don't remember all the of them. The Lelotches. Ah, I can't think what the name of it is, but um, yes. And the guy that painted by numbers. The um, Oh, yeah, the frizzy hair. And Grizzly Adams. Yep. Little House on the Prairie. I remember all that. I remember, you know, I remember the shows, and I wasn't really allowed to watch. I grew up in a pretty religious house, and I was not allowed to really watch Dukes of Hazard because old Daisy was popping out of that shirt, you know, and out of her <laughs> I butt. I remember Dukes of her, Hazard. Her butt was popping out. Her I, as you a got young, your Daisy Dukes on. As a young boy, I certainly liked Daisy Dukes, so that was, that was great. But I watched the Dukes of Hazard. That was awesome. And, you know, I remember the show called The Greatest American Hero. Do you yeah. remember that? It was that a little kind early of. for you? That was probably early Vaguely. 80s when that came out. Yeah. And remember, this is what people that were born in 65 to 80. So I grew up in the 80s. Yeah. Like that's, I graduated high school in 87. Wonder Woman and Superman and Star Wars. Oh, man, those things were so yeah. great. Knight Rider. Remember Knight Rider that I remember came out? Knight Rider, yeah. That was a car that drove itself yeah. and talked. And here we are. Yes. Now we have cars that talk to us and drive with Tesla and all that. So yeah. it's, it's uh, yeah. How about the show Dallas? Are you guys allowed to watch oh. that? 
we weren't allowed to watch it, but you know, growing up in Dallas, it was certainly a big deal. I would imagine I was not allowed to watch it. Plus, it was a little advanced for me. It was kind of a my, late night my mom soap watched opera. it, so yeah, it was a late night soap opera. My mom yeah. did watch it, so sometimes I would catch some of it. But then, for a long time, there was the Who Shot Jr. Who Shot Jr. That yeah. was a that was a nationwide, maybe a worldwide phenomenon yeah. that happened pre-internet. Yes. Like we didn't have internet to, to get that word around. It just made its way around through no, schools they were quite and the through, phenomenon. you know, it sounds like we're old, like well, we are old, like it made its way around through schools and villages <laughs> and the radios and the, you know, it was the radio and TV. That's where we yeah. heard things from. Magazines. That was our, yeah. that was our way of getting information, right? We had to, yeah. yeah, we had to look at magazines and learn that. And I remember, you know, I do remember growing up in the, in the eighties and having a record player. My brother, oh, yeah. my brother was in, he served in the military. He was in the air force and he came home. Gosh, 84, 83, 84, he came home from Germany and he had a huge record collection. Yes, record, not CDs. He had records and he had this Wampin stereo system. Is Wampin a word? So it's a, <laughs> it it's, is now. It's, it is now. So this huge stereo system that he had and it had this cool, if you remember the turntables, had these cool strobe lights on the side that yeah. would go back and forth. And so I remember putting putting those records on, putting Lover Boy on, and putting um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think other other. He had like Pink Floyd, all all the all yeah. the music in the '80s that we had, and I remember well listening to those just just crazy loud. That's why my ears are half gone nowadays because music was big to us back then. But yeah. I grew I grew up on a lot of country, and then as a teenager, I got more into some rock. But like I grew up on George Strait and Tanya Tucker and Reba McIntyre right. in Alabama. Oh and really? Johnny Lee and oh yeah, all those. Oh wow. Okay. No, I heard about them, but again, we weren't allowed to listen to rock music because it was it was not Christian. Yeah. And so you know, Roger Roger would make sure that we heard it good and loud. My brother when uh, when mom left, mom and dad would leave because you know we were always left alone. Yeah. But Roger was back home as an adult. And I got to I got to hang around some adults when I was a kid. So yeah, was, there was a lot of cool. that like. Everybody thought Kiss meant night and Satan service, and Ozzy Osbourne oh, yes. was eating the head, the heads off of kittens in the crowd. And, you know, well, he actually ate the head of a bat. I they remember he, he that. He actually yeah. did that. Yeah, that was yeah. something he actually did. He bit the head off a bat on yeah. stage. But yeah, so yeah. But some, so, some of the other bands that we grew up on, uh, like I mean, the 80s good rock music, bands. Wham and George Michael and. Um, well, that wasn't the great band I thought about when I thought about well, George Michael, but I he was, but he was awesome. He was great. Madonna he was, was big he during was then. Big. Madonna was big. I wore my eighties inspired. I wanted to get in the mood today. So I wore my eighties inspired off the shoulder shirt today. Like, I, uh, I kind of like it. So. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, though, I mean, Madonna, I mean, yeah, she like took the world by storm and who was the first concert you ever saw? You know, I don't know. I, I growing up in Dallas, there were so many bands that came through. I, I went to a lot of shows growing up. I, my first concert was at SPAC, which is up in Saratoga, Saratoga Performing Arts Center. It's an outdoor, indoor amphitheater. And I saw Loverboy. I had to sneak out of the house to go see it because I was not allowed to go to concerts. My boy, my best friend, Brian Schaefer, and I went together. I remember he climbed up in a tree so we could see, I think tickets were $7 to go. I think okay. I, I always remember that. It was $7 to go to the concert. We were on the lawn. We had lawn seats. And Brian got pulled out of a tree and his pants got half ripped. Out. I always remember Brian always got beat up when we went out for some reason. They left me alone, but he was he was a bigger guy. So they went after him. But um, yeah, that was great. And then I remember I was in high school and I saw Bon Jovi at RPI Fieldhouse. Now, you, you listeners may or may not know where that is. I don't even know if it's still a place, but RPI College had a fieldhouse. And that was a small arena when Slippery When Wet came out, okay. Bon Jovi. Oh, that was a great album. And I was in third row, right up on the stage, just missed getting a high five from Johnny, came out on the stage. This is back, this is in 87. Yeah. The year I graduated from high school. So I remember being at that concert, went to uh, Deep Purple, and I uh, went to see Heart and Def Leppard. Oh, Def Leppard. I've seen them several. They are so, they were one of my favorites. Yeah. Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses. Yeah. I mean, so many good bands from that oh, era. Oh, Guns N' Roses I mean, they, they just... You two, the cure. So here's a question that I have for you, and the audience may not know this, but you're a diehard Pearl Jam fan. Yeah, baby, best band ever. Yeah, so that's not really true. So, <laughs> so let's let's move on. So they're okay if you like yelling all the time. So what anyways, they have a, a cult following. Better to, I they do. I'll give you credit for that. They have a crazy cult following. My, we've been to a few shows together. Yep. My question is, how are you a Gen Xer? And so I think of Gen Xers as liking as liking the music we just talked about, yeah. all the glam rock. I and love all, all of it. So, but but how is that? Because that still falls in the category of people that were Gen X. Yeah. But yet you love Pearl Jam, which is grunge. Yeah, it's grunge. that was the Nirvana. The yeah. who else was in that? The Nirvana and Pearl Jam. Those were the two and, biggest ones for sure. Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, sure. Temple of, Temple of Dog was kind of a combination of them. But yeah, yeah. all those guys. 
But you liked you. I always wonder how you were a, a Gen Xer like me, but you like Pearl Jam so I much. I just I fell in love with his voice. Like I just love. Yeah, his and voice. people should understand too that you like it so much that when we get in the car, the kids are like, <laughs> "We can turn that dad." I'm like, "Oh, if we get in mom's car, that's all she listens to is the Pearl Jam station." At least I have some variety in my music. But yeah, I don't know. But music concerts were amazing back then. The funny part is, I think that music today. I don't even know what it is today. It's again, I sound like an old guy saying that, but I am. It's so much. It's, I don't know. I don't find it very storytelling like. I don't find it very. It depends on the artist. There's not nearly as many. I don't think that today's so, music will be remembered nearly like eighty. Oh, you don't think Taylor Swift will be remembered? I mean, maybe some of her okay. songs, but, so, but 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 will they stand the test of time? Like everything back from the eighties, that music is still playing to this day. I still. think some of it will. So so you know. This happens. Taylor almost. Swift, she's the anomaly. But there's a lot of people that were heavy, that were big like Taylor Swift. I think there's not many today. There's not many to us because you choose not to listen to it because you're stuck in Gen X music. I don't like you anymore. We're, we're done no, talking. No, I'm serious. I'm we're serious. done talking but, about it. But think about our parents. Think about our parents. Turn that noise down, you know, because that wasn't their yeah. music. My mom grew up on Elvis. You know, that was very different than than what we listened to. So so I think because we do have younger kids that I, and maybe because I'm forced to listen to their music in the car because that's all they want to listen to. And right now, Taylor Swift is all our daughter plays. Yeah. Um. You know, like. I'm starting to like some of it just because it's, I listen to it more often, whereas you don't listen to it very often. So I try, you, you don't I try not to, you, you don't know even what's out there that could be good. All right. So anyways, I like how you always make sure I'm wrong in every episode for one thing well, or the other. It's so pretty easy to do. Yeah. Oh, aren't you cute? I just <laughs> love you so much. Okay. Anyway. So I was thinking about different games we played too, as kids that were very different than in the Gen X era. Yeah. And one thing that I had asked you about was jarts. Yeah, no idea what that is. How do you not know what a jart is? A jart know. was a, a heavy metal um, spike that had plastic wings on it that you would throw underhand up in the air and you'd try and get an arc as high as you could and land it in a circle. It was so heavy, it would, it would drive itself into the ground. And if your foot happened to be in place there, well, it would do that too. So people, yeah. more people were hurt and injured with jarts growing up. I don't know. My brothers and I shot each other with BB guns. So <laughs> well, I did that too. So that's another thing too. Yeah, me and my one of my one of my old friends, Jerome Edmonds. I remember we were uh, we were we were in the cornfield out by my house, and we were playing. And one time I stood up, and he shot me dead in the middle of the back. Oh, he <laughs> laid me right out. Man, that hurt. No, we had capa shoes. Were big in Texas, so we had these leather capa shoes, and we would shoot at each other's shoes, and we would shoot locusts out of trees. Okay, we got to be quite the good shots. Yeah. I remember, I, do you know, I still have a Rubik's cube that's in a plastic container. I never opened oh, it. it it's still money. in the plastic wrap. Now it's worth 30 bucks. Oh, I thought so too. I was like, Hey, I've had this for 40 yeah, years. There was a lot of them. It's still in the original wrapper. Yeah. I never touched it. And there it is. I never could sell that stupid thing. I think I got three, three sides one time is all I ever got, but we had a Walkman for music. Yeah. Do you ever have a Walkman? I did. I think I was a little older. So Walkman yeah. was a cassette player. Yeah. A cassette player and a radio. Yeah. And that's all you had. Then they moved on to CD players sometime in the nineties. But yeah. I had a, boxes. I well, I want I had a Walkman that was waterproof. I okay. was I was high tech. I had worked in saved. Of course you did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> well, I, I used to love again, I love scuba diving, but yeah. I used to dive in my my uncle aunt and uncle's um lake that they lived on. And I'd spend time bombing the dock looking around, just free diving. Oh, and, really? Oh yeah. And I used to put that music with That's me. actually a story I haven't heard three times, any. Oh, aren't you cute today? You're just so full of you're so full of cute little things today. So anyway, I'm going to choose to ignore you. And I used to listen to Van Halen. I listened to Van Halen, their first album. Another great one, yeah. Yes, when I was down uh, at the bottom of the water, I thought I was high tech doing that. But yeah, my my buddy Brian, who I talked about before, he had uh, an Atari. That oh, was the I first loved video. Atari. Yeah, first video Donkey game that Kong ever and came Centipede out. Centipede and yeah, Pac Man. Yeah, all that. So we had so much fun as kids. It was such a, such a great. To me, it was such a great childhood, a great time to grow yeah. up. I think I almost feel bad today because people that are on the internet today, everyone is so glued to their phones. Yeah. They're not enjoying the, you know, e e Evil Knievel was big. Do you remember Evil Knievel? I do. So he was really big when I was a kid. Like you bought toys about yeah. Evil Knievel. He would jump the craziest crap. He yes. jumped the a section of the Grand Canyon. He jumped yes. a building. He jumped. I mean, he was he was death defying. He was crazy. He broke every bone in his body yeah. or there or close to it. That man, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he must be in tremendous agony as he got older. I any, anyway, as kids growing up in the country, we had Schwinn bicycles and we would actually set up a long piece of plywood on a milk crate and sometimes two milk crates and make these crazy ass jumps that we would go off of. And, yeah. you know, as a kid, 
That's what we did. Oh, I remember uh, some friends of mine taking their bike to the roof of their house. They had a swimming pool and riding the bike off of the <laughs> roof and dump, you know, dropping into the oh, pool. Oh, those were the good times. Yeah. Those were the good times. I tell you, that was a lot of fun. So, you know, I'm thinking about kind of leading into what stuff cost back then, right? Just if yeah. you look at inflation, sometimes I think it's good to look back and say, okay, where, what did things cost back then? And did a little research here. And, you know, gas was 50 cents a gallon in 87. I remember it being less than a dollar. I don't I, remember yeah, it being 50, 50 yeah, cents, but I do remember it being less than a dollar. 50 seems low. Again, this is a nationwide average. I remember being less than a dollar. But let's say 50 cents. They said milk was 228 a gallon. That sounds high to me. That for does some to reason. me too. I'm not sure who did the research on this for us. So I'll have to check on that. But I, I have to look at that. But the, I do know the median home price in January of 87 was $98,500. Yeah. That was the average highest nationwide. Now, where I was in upstate New York, I bet I would be willing to bet they're more like 60, 70,000. Yeah, I think where I grew up, I, my mom and dad built their house like in, let's see, they got married in 78, so probably 79, 80, and I don't think it was nearly that much. Yeah. So we should probably shoot the person that researches for us, <laughs> yeah. but maybe it's not exactly or not. Yeah. I'm just kidding. So, so some of the numbers aren't exactly right on here, but we did we did look it up yesterday. Again, shows you that online is full of just crap information, right? Trying to right. figure it out all the time. But the point is, it was a lot less expensive. Now, th this is true. How much did you get paid in your first your first job that was official? You worked for your family. But... I did. I started working full time when I was like 13 years old. And I can remember to the penny how much I was paid. $3.85 an hour. That's what minimum wage was. That's what I got paid. That's what your brothers got paid too, right? Yep. So my, I, I had many jobs growing up, of course, mowing lawns and painting fences. Did I tell you about the fence I painted three times? Um, and then some, <laughs> I did paint that twice. That, though. that story gets, you know, embellished a little more every time too. Well, it was true. freezing cold. You were, had bare feet. You walked uphill both ways. Well, so <laughs> that the bull that was behind the fence, you know, was, was charging you. Are right, you done making fun of me? <laughs> so, um, my first job was around the same thing. My first, so I had lots of jobs that were just cash. And then I had the first official job. Well, I bagged groceries for my dad at the Navy commissary my, where my dad w was a butcher and I bagged groceries. That was straight tips. My first job in the books was Friendly's Ice Cream in upstate New York and great place for a guy who loves ice cream. That's bet for that, sure. Bet you never stole any ice cream. No, <laughs> never made it. Never made a dessert on accident. The wrong one. So it sat in the back and softened up so I could eat it later. No, I never did that. Um, but I made I think it was three, three thirty, three forty, three fifty, whatever the minimum wage was. That's what I made yeah. per hour. Now. It's twenty five dollars an hour yep. in California. Yep. Twenty five. Insane. And, and other places it's fifteen. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy how inflation. So when you're talking about inflation, and there's a point to what I'm talking about here today. Imagine if you had started saving for your retirement, and this this is what this whole episode is about. And sorry, we got off on a long tangent about Gen X. It's just it's my passion. I love Gen X. It's who it's who I am. But. Well, what well, I'm smiling right now because we just started giving our 11 year old an allowance, and you were like. I said, you know, what do you think? She's 11. Let's give her like $11 a week. And you're like, well, we only gave Peyton 10. I'm like, yeah, but that was like 10 years ago. Like there's been inflation since yeah, then. She true. can't buy anything with that's 10 true. bucks. So th this episode is called the Gen X gut check, because I think a lot of us wake up one day as Gen Xers and say, wow, we're in our 40s and 50s. Where'd the time go? Where'd the time go? And how much do I have left? Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of us wake up and say, you know, best case scenario as a Gen Xer, I'm in the second half of life. When you hit 50. That was different. I, I hit 50 December of last year. And, yes. and I think for the first time in my life, I feel different. Like none of the other birthdays ever really yes. bothered me. And I don't know if this one bothers me so much, but just, I, it, I just feel different. I feel like a grown up. <laughs> it, makes you, it makes you it makes you reflect. Yeah. I think a lot of people. If you're a 40 year old listener to this right now, I assure you that when you hit 50, something sort of changes it does. because you realize that best case scenario, according to the hour, even if you live to, to 100, which must my goal is to live to 100. But even at that, you do succeed to live to 100. You're in the second half of your life. Yeah. And if things aren't going right inside you or it's something brewing inside of one of us, we don't know what's what's we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We could be in the fourth quarter. Yeah. We don't even know exactly where we're at. And I think that makes a lot of Gen Xers do a, do a real gut check and say, wait a minute, am I prepared for retirement? And do I want to live the rest of my life like I lived the first half? Or do I want to really get secure for my retirement? And I think people that are listening to this, some people think they're secure for retirement, but they don't. I want to dive into some numbers here and talk about it. 
but I want us to talk about compound interest. Compound interest is your friend. I remember having meetings with life insurance guys. It was your friend. It was your friend. Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? It is your it friend. It is your friend. It, it, it is your friend when you're 20 or yeah, 30. <laughs> it's younger people's friend. Yes. It's yeah. <laughs> compound interest has escaped us. Yeah, lots of things escapes as we get older, right? So your eyesight. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, exactly. It escapes us like your eyesight escapes you because now I now my team makes fun of me and goes, "Can we put the print any bigger for you, Glenn?" I'm like, "Yeah, okay, I can't see. It's the way it is." You guys who are Gen Xers know exactly what I'm talking about. We go blind as we get older, but compound interest, if you can take advantage of it, is great. The problem is you've lost the ability now to take advantage of compound interest. If you now, what's compound interest? Compound interest is when you are, start saving money. And that money gets interest. And as the interest gets bigger, the interest is now paid on the interest. And then the interest gets paid on the interest on the interest and the interest on the interest on the interest on the interest. And before you know it, that's compounding your wealth. It's, it's, like, it's like a rock that's rolling downhill that's picking up debris along the way. It just yes. gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that's bigger, a good analogy. Bigger and bigger. I mean, rock, do a lot of rocks pick up debris or you think like a mud ball pick up debris? I'm just Okay, tumbleweed. I mean, I, oh, okay. what the hell? <laughs> tumbleweed picks up debris down the way? That's a big tumbleweed. They, they get bigger and bigger. I don't, never saw that happen, but maybe that happened in Texas. <laughs> okay, so the power of compound. Only in the wild west. <laughs> compound interest. So if you were to save $300 a month for 35 years, so imagine you start at 18, 20 years old in that ballpark and you save $300 a month, like you- you actually started saving. Roadrunner, roadrunner, the, the ball that gets bigger and bigger. Are you bigger still back on I that? I am. Oh my Lord, will you let it go I already? I mean, Gen Xers so should understand that one. They do understand, but what, can we just please move on from the rolling ball of debris <laughs> that you're discussing? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. All right, so $300 a month for 35 years, you will have saved $126,000. That's how much principal you put in over 35 years at 300 bucks a month. But the total value of that investment is $688,000. Yep. So you put it in 126, but because of compound interest, it's worth $688,000. Now let's go and say, okay, let's say someone didn't start 35 years ago, they started 15 years ago. So if you started 15 years ago and put $300 a month for 15 years at 8%, the whole thing is worth 104,000. A whopping 100. So you miss that first 20 years of, of compound compounding. Interest. That compounding interest and the extra 300 bucks a month, which is not that much different, the, the result at the end is astronomically different, 688,000 versus 104,000. Yep. So that's what happens when you miss out on compound interest. Mm -hmm. I know we did some research if you want to read to folks what we found at the Federal Reserve yep. website. This is the Federal Reserve for... Gen Xers and how much we have saved. Yeah, the median retirement savings by age in the U.S. So a, the Gen X age group, age 45 to 54 is $100,000. And then age 55 to 64 is $134,000. So then my question to you is, how in the world do you live on $100,000 in investments? Even if you were a master investor and you were able to get 10% return on that money, that's $10,000 a year. Right. You can't live on that. And, and I, I guess my, my challenge to everybody listening is, are you wanting to live off what you saved or do you want to live off the interest of what you saved? Because right. if you want to pass something on to your family, which a lot of us do, <laughs> I have some people that go, screw the kids. They can do take care of themselves. Well, a lot of us want to leave a legacy to our kids, a little something, right? Yeah, little absolutely. Something. Maybe we were left something by our parents. Maybe we weren't. But you know, how, how can we provide a great life for our kids? And if we only have a hundred thousand and that's, by the way, that's like 90% of America has like a hundred grand saved yeah. as a Gen Xer. So if you're listening to this, if you say, yeah, Glenn, but I got 300 grand saved or 500 grand saved. So. Yeah. And people are living longer today. So if you're living longer, you're going to need more money. And I think Gen Xers are going to live a lot longer because we're tough. Yep. We were brought up tough, baby. We're not, we're not wusses, right? We don't get sick and colds all the time. We're, we're strong. Yep. So I think that you, I think you'll find as we go on. If that you, you learn to stop cooking with Crisco and drinking sweet and low. Yeah. My mother used to call me, my mother used to say, look at you. You look like Crisco fat in the can. Isn't that <laughs> no. nice? That was terrible. What, who says something like that to their kid? That's what she used to say to me. Hey, you look like Crisco fat in the can. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's lovely. Terrible. That's the kind of tough shit I had to put up with as a kid, right? They were tough. So, oh my God. 
Clearly, I let that go. <laughs> it's only been 40 years. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. Oh, my God. Chris, go fat McCann. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk about this because I think that people, here, here's the gut check part of this. The gut check part is, do you have enough money to retire? Yeah. Right? Most people don't. Are you still thinking about the fat McCann comment? <laughs> Because I feel like you're just going to laugh until I get the, like, I'm laugh gonna, it out. I'm kind of picturing the Pillsbury Doughboy right now. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, my my good friend Becky used to call me that growing up as a kid, too. I just love all the fat jokes all of a sudden. Now I'm getting fat shamed in my own in my own podcast. Oh, my Lord. You brought it up. Oh, my Lord. This is terrible. This is not good for me today. But that's okay. I'll take it. So anyway, I am tough. You got that right. So, all right, let's go back to this. Let's get off the fat in the can and the Crisco and the, all that stuff. So. Let's go back to the uh, the scenario. Most people. Yeah, what are your choices? Well, most people want to, they say, okay, I want to retire and I have a half million bucks. Well, so what? Yeah. Because if you live longer, if you if you retire at age, let's say 70, and you're going to live another 20 years to probably 90 now. I mean, the, the average life expectancy of a male is like 73 or I think that's right now, 73 years. But they, that's also taking into account people that die at birth and people, that's a whole range of people. Right. A lot of people live now. My dad passed at 86 um, or 80, 86, 87, 86. Yeah. Uh, mom just turned 87. You know, I've got some, some hardiness in our family and a lot of, a lot of people live in the eighties and nineties. We had neighbors live well into the nineties. So a lot more people are living longer these days. The problem is it costs money to live longer. So if you have a half a million dollars, if you say, I'm going to live off that, how long will you actually, if you do the math, You'll be out of money in 10, 15 years. Yeah. I mean, we saw that other recent survey that was done where it takes, you know, the average single person is going to need $100,000 a year to live. The average family needs $235,000 to live. And, and you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, inflation is going to be even greater. So you have to ask yourself the question, do you have enough money to retire? And what quality of life do you want to have when you retire? Right. You know, if you're, if you're 70 years old and let's say you're single, do you want to have roommates <laughs> or do you want to have your own home? Like, like, or do you want to you live in a home? Do you want to, do you want to live in a home? Mm. Like a nice home or a home that's run by the state? Or, or if you do need health care, do you want home health care? Right. Do you want to have to be in a nursing? Like, like there's all these different um, quality of life questions that need that present themselves too. And, yeah. and you can sweep those under the rug, but they're going to bite you in the butt later. If you don't figure this stuff out again, you need to be very strategic planning about your retirement and what you want out of life. I want to tell you something. When you're thinking about this, we have a, we have a website for you. I'd love you to go check out if you want to just go to genxgutcheck.com. That's genxgutcheck.com. There's some cool tools on there that kind of get you an idea of where you stand. I think it's important that we know as Gen X is where we stand because we can deal with anything because we're strong, but it's better if we know what's coming and kind of plan for it in advance. So people have always asked, you know, why, why did you guys choose real estate? And I think one of the reasons is, is that it helps people make up time. Yeah. Like it helps people make up time because it, you can't, what are you gonna do? Save an extra, like if I said, okay, you have to say, you have to have, by the way, the average person, if you want to have a decent life in retirement and live off the interest needs to have over $2 million saved. Yep, 2.4 million dollars. Yep. You need to have that saved in retirement. You can do the math and research. It's a whole different episode, but you can do, uh, you just take, take what you Take what you want to live off per month and divide it by the interest rate you'll be earning, and it comes up with a number. So, what I mean is, most people, if you want to live on eight, nine thousand dollars a month pre-tax in 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 money that's twenty years from now, it'd be more like ten ten grand or twelve grand. You're going to have to have a couple million dollars saved. Yeah. And again, we we're saying that because if you say, "Well, I'm just going to live off my principal," do you really want to have the stress? of knowing that every day you're chipping away at your future. Right. And mentally you're thinking, I'm out of money in 10 years at yeah. this pace. And what if I you live longer? Yeah. And you start, I bet you start checking out. Oh, sure. You're like, I don't want to live past not having any money. Yeah. I don't want to be a burden on my kids. Right. So I'm going to encourage people to live off the interest that they earn. So let's talk about real estate. You know, before you jump in there though, I, I think it's quite interesting that, you know, we, we discussed before the average, the median home price in January of 87 was 98.5. And that's oh, so nationwide. Nationwide. That, that includes California and, and everything I think else. that's probably a little high, but let's let's just go with it. So let, let's say let's let's round and say that's a hundred thousand dollars. The median home price today, and this sounds about right, three hundred and twenty two thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. So that's what? A three hundred percent increase? Yeah. I mean I mean <laughs> that, so that's inflation. Yeah. In 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 that time frame. That's what happens with investments like that. If you if if you took a hundred thousand dollars and put it in a shoebox. In 1987, worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Today, not much. 
it'd be, it will be worth probably about $30,000. Yeah. That's about the buying power you'd have because it's not worth it because you didn't invest it. The reason that we do what we do and teach what we teach is to help people. Number one, first, let's have that Gen X gut check. And then number two is how do I fix it? Yeah. Real estate investing, you don't do it just to do it. You do it because there's a purpose. The purpose is I want to get money. I want to make up my retirement. One statistic that's always been kind of an aha moment for me is that, you know, and it's a little bit market dependent, of course, but home prices typically double in value every 10 to 15 years. So the next 10 to 15 years are going to go by anyway. Yeah. You know, would you invest $100,000 to get $200,000 in 10 years? Yeah. Heck yeah, I'd do that every, any day. So watch this. If you were to buy let's just say, you know, our, we encourage people to, to at least buy two houses a year. We, we like people to flip two and hold two. That's mm-hmm. kind of a cool, I, I think if you learn how to flip two houses to make cash and then hold two houses a year to build wealth alongside your current job, part-time, yep. but that's your part-time hustle. That's what you do to make up the difference in your life. If you did that, and if you did it the way we teach by using other people's money and other people's time and other people's experience, if you did that, If you were to buy two houses a year for 10 years and then just stop. That's 20 houses. Keep putting all that rent that comes in, all the money you make, put it towards paying off the house, do your thing as fast as you can. At the end of the day, in today's value, the average house is worth $322,000, 20 houses being worth $6.45 million. And the truth is, in these will be paid off in about 15 years from now. If you snowball this, Mm -hmm. this, uh, if you, again, so as you're, you're making payments on your houses because your tenants are paying the rent, right? The tenants are paying rent. You have a property management company doing the work for you and you're paying off your mortgages as, as the first two pay off the ones you bought this year. Then you start putting that, all that rent towards the next one, yep. towards the next one. Then they so start compounding. Essentially, you'd have 20 houses paid off in about 15 years is roughly maybe 16 years from today. So if you're 50 years old, when you're 67 years old, right? Which you know, you're going to be, yep. and you're going to have 30 years left of your life. You're going to have houses that in today's value are worth $6.45 million. And honestly, and in the next 15 years, 20, that's probably going to double. They're probably going to double. Exactly. So it's, you're talking about 14, $15 yeah. million dollars in net worth that you create yeah. by owning two houses a year and just letting it snowball like an IRA. And you could even do it in a self-directed IRA. That's a whole different episode. I hope people understand that that's not high in the sky. Like that's not extreme. And I I think one thing that people that holds people back from wanting to do um, rentals in particular is, is what you mentioned about, you know, thinking they have to be landlords. But if you man, if you hire a property management company and do that right, you never have those headaches. We started buying our rentals and, and kind of ignored that side of our business because we were so busy working on the other sides of our business that they just started depreciating and we didn't even know it. Like, like it just happened. That made us multimillionaires. It did. That's the part that the, the cat, the cash earning didn't make us multimillionaires. Right. It was the, it was the rental portfolio that made us multimillionaires because right. all of a sudden we look back and said, wow, things it's appreciating. Debt is being reduced. The property is appreciating in value. We get tax deductions mm-hmm. because of it. You know, it's a, it's a, and we're not managing them and right. we didn't use any of our own money to buy them. And that's what we teach everybody, as you know. And so I think that people just really underestimate the power of just start buying a couple of houses alongside what you do. Yep. Let them appreciate in value. Yep. Let the tenants pay them off. And now, not only do you have $15 million in houses, but the odds are with 20 houses, you'll be netting about $1,000 or more per month after all expenses. Once they're paid off. That's $20,000 a month in income cash that flow. comes in cash flow to your house. And that's, that's, a, that's a minimal number. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because in the next 15 years, Rent's going to be more than a thousand bucks a month. Rent's already more than a thousand bucks a month. I, for no, a no, three. no. Well, I'm saying you're net. So after you pay taxes, okay. after you pay your expenses, maintenance. Still in 15 years, it's probably going to be more than that. I, I am yeah. agreeing, but let's say it's 25,000 a month that comes to your household. You have a $15 million nest egg that you can do what you want with. Sell it, give it to your kids, pass it on. And you're making $25,000 a month in passive income right. from your rentals. You know, and, and again, if you do this right and have a property manager run everything, a good property manager that runs, it's just 20 houses. Yeah. It's not like you're having 200 of them. Yeah. It's 20 houses and you can sell them off individually if you want to. There's lots of other variables. That's powerful. Yeah. Can you live off of 25 grand in a year, uh, a, a and, month? And not touch your principal, right. which is, which is still growing. And appreciating. Appreciating inside there. So people wonder why we get so passionate about real estate is because we can help people it's catch powerful. up. You can catch yeah. up. How else could you catch up? 
Yeah. You can, I mean, <clears throat> play the stock market. You can, I mean, you could take really risky. risky. Yeah. And you're going to risk your own capital, right? You're going to risk your own capital to try to grow that capital. You could take it. You know, if you have a hundred grand saves as a Gen Xer right now, and that's all you've got. You can go to the craps table and put it all on black if you want to and just try it or, or the roulette table mm -hmm. and just try, you know, the, it's really a gamble. You could try and go into crypto. You can try and learn something else, but really real estate is it, that it's a proven track it's record. Historical, yeah. And I don't think there's anything you could do to save your way to $15 million that produces $25,000 a month. That's 300 grand a year in passive income. I just don't know how, what else you can do. If you do, by all means, Comment, Enlighten me. <laughs> comment here and find us on YouTube or whatever and, and have a conversation with me. I'd love to do it to show me why real estate doesn't work and help Gen Xers like us be able to catch up and do this really good. So I tell you, just the good news, bottom line is that with real estate, it's never too late. Yep. You can even just go out and buy a few houses. I mean, just go, go buy one a year for five years. Just do something though. Do something. You'll be a millionaire. If you're not a millionaire already, you'll be a millionaire. Yeah, there, there's a reason the hedge funds are buying a lot of these up. Like, don't let them know something that you don't, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we're, we're becoming a rental society. Single family homes are valuable. It's the way to go. I tell you, it's been a fun episode for me talking about Gen X, kind of reflecting a little bit. I love, I love Gen X. As my friends make fun of me, like, you still listen to 80s music? I said, I sure do, man. That's what I listen to. Our kids are 80s. getting into it. They are. They listen to Queen, Queen now. They love Queen. They love Queen. So, yeah. yeah so we do a lot of Queen listening on the way to school. And I think it's just important to look at where we were back then. But then they're, they're digging some GNR too, just so you know. They are? Yeah. Yeah. That, oh, that, really? They're yeah. Like, oh boy, Guns and Roses. I don't I, want I them hearing all that music. But yeah, <laughs> we'll have to be selective on the Guns and Roses songs they listen to. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked what you heard, make sure you click that like button. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next episode where I'll be making fun of Glenn again. 